Cordell Berger. I am a lung, double lung transplant recipient. I am also a master's prepared nurse and have been for 40 years. Um, it's interesting that I started my career at Penn as a new nurse. When left Penn about 15 years ago to go to Einstein for an opportunity and came full circle and got my transplant at Penn. And I have fortunately been doing really, really well since then. I was always in either neurosurgery or I was a clinical specialist for um, surgical intensive care unit and a manager. And now I am doing kidney transplant. Um, and the transition is unbelievable. George, George, let me interrupt you. Did I miss it or did you say what kind of transplant you had? I said it. Did he? I, I okay. Said I just didn't know if we caught it on here. Go ahead. Um, so I want to talk to you about a couple of things today. And for some of us, this will really be impacting. Some of us, not so much. But getting that difficult letter, I know uh, you communicate with your donor all the time. But um, communicating with your donor family is, first of all, very anonymous. And occasionally, we get a letter back it's also very anonymous, very thank you for writing, you're such a kind person. But eventually, and I had this occur to me about a year ago, um, my donor family decided they wanted to give me more information than I was ready for at that time. And you have to stop and think, like, so how do I handle this? I, I don't want to stop writing to them. I don't want to tell them the impact that their response had on my life but I have to do something. So I did some investigating and I read a lot of journals and I bothered the people at Gifted Life insensibly and they were like ready to kill me, I think. But um, what I came away with was I'm going to write back to my donor family. I'm going to acknowledge the things that I want to acknowledge and I'm going to ignore the things that were too heavy for me to bear. That worked out really well. Um, I didn't by any means, I didn't expect an apology or I didn't expect her to say, you know, I didn't, I didn't mean to tell you all that information. I mean, I got everything but her tax return. Um, and it was a little intimidating, I, I must be honest. Um, and I, I chose to respond in that way. And then when I did my investigations here, they agreed that it was probably the best way to respond. I mean, I acknowledged her name, I acknowledged my donor's name. Um, acknowledged his age because that was very impacting to me. It, it, my donor was a year older than my own child. So for me, that was a little more than I can handle at that time. And I think that's a problem that a lot of people have. I think people just don't, like, how do I respond? And I had a situation, of a very good friend of mine, in fact, my transplant, my rehab partner after my transplant, who, as bizarre it may seem, there were three male nurses transplanted in a week. One wow. on Friday, one on Monday, one on Wednesday. I was Monday. Uh, even more bizarre is we all had a connection with one school of nursing. My sister was an administrator at it. The, the one gentleman who was transplanted on Friday was in fact, um, his wife was the dean of the program. The third gentleman who was Wednesday went to school there. So it was like, okay, this is bizarre. Mm -hmm. His family wrote his donor family a letter telling them that he died. And I, I wish that they had called me before they did that. Because we did have a relationship going and I felt like that's not something that the donor family ever wants to hear. You can cut off relations, don't say anything, but I don't, I don't think it's fair to tell somebody that their loved one died twice, so to speak. Um, it happened. Coincidentally, the letter that I got that was more information than I wanted was the day of his funeral. So it may have tipped me a little bit over the top just because of the timing. But um, so I did talk to the family, and they did get in touch with the donor family one more time. And they did it in a more peaceful, kind, memories kind of fashion and I thought that was really a better way of doing things. 
Then the second thing I want to talk about is how do you make the transition from being a transplant recipient or donor to actually being a transplant coordinator? And I have to be honest with you, it was very difficult for me. I went into it thinking, oh, well, nobody knows more about transplant than me, and I got this all together, and we're going to get this. These transplant recipients are going to be like <laughs> knocking down the doors to come to us. Truth be told, I found that I was a little bit of a transplant bigot. People were coming in, and a lot of times people that need kidneys come in feeling a little entitled, feeling like sometimes they don't need to do anything different with their lives in order to get the kidney. So the first time I had a patient come to me um, to be a potential candidate for a transplant, first thing he said to me was, well, I don't always go to dialysis. I don't always stay for the whole treatment. I continue to do cocaine, and I drink whatever I want to drink. I don't follow the diet. And, it's, and I walked away, and it's like, oh my god, Like, are we really going to put this person on the list? And making that transition was very difficult for me. It was like, first I'm a nurse. My, my whole career has been on the donor side. I was all about getting potentially people that were in that brain death category to get their families to agree to be donors. Now I'm on the other side of the coin, and, I'm, and that conflict was very strong for me. It was, how can I possibly give somebody that really doesn't care about themselves something that somebody gave up their life for? And, and I had a difficult time for about six months. And then I, I just really thought about it. And I read a lot of papers and journals, and I spoke to a lot of experienced people. And, I, and basically, I came away with everybody is entitled to whatever they possibly can get, and however they can improve their lives. If they have a lung transplant, a heart, a kidney, or whatever, and they don't improve their lives, that's shame on them. But I clearly, I mean, I knew from the very first time, I had no right to have an opinion about whether or not somebody should get a transplant. God knows, maybe the people that, were, that I went and got evaluated by might have thought, that, mm, you're not so hot yourself. Um, but I just couldn't adapt to that, you know, not being compliant with the rules. I mean, you know for yourself, being a kidney recipient, there's certain things you have to do. There's a diet you need to follow. There's behaviors that you need to maintain. If that's not important to you when you're so sick, what's it going to be like when you're better? Are you going to take your medications? Are you going to do what you need to do? So I just transitioned myself completely around and decided I'm going to teach them until their eyeballs fall out. And if they still want to move forward with a transplant, they're either going to convert to doing the right thing or they're going to back out of it because they're tired of hearing it. Well, fortunately, none of them backed out of it. They all eventually came along and did what they needed to do. And now I feel very satisfied. I feel very satisfied. Um, I've been in that, I've, I was in that job about six months, and they asked me to become the manager of the kidney pancreas department. So now I only do living donors because then I don't have that conflict of the people waiting for a transplant and the living donors. They have to be completely separate coordinators. So now I do living donors, and I'm loving that. So you're coordinating the living donors. Mm -hmm. Einstein. At Einstein. Through, through Einstein. And um, that's, that's another thing that's a little strange because when people first get diagnosed as needing a kidney transplant, people come out of the woodwork. There's people, I mean, the numbers of people that come out, I've had up to nine people come out for one person. Now, of those nine people, maybe two are really eligible. We got you, there's 14. 14. That's unbelievable. Now, how many of them were actually eligible to be donors? Five. That's a lot. Yeah. That is a lot of people. It was his parents. You're a lucky man. Yeah. His siblings. He's one of seven. He knows it. <laughs> as long as he has, you know, as long as you know how lucky you are. And our son were tested as potential donors. Wow, that is unbelievable. So, what was that? Seven, six, eight, ten, five, like that maybe eleven. One of the benefits of a huge family, which you both have, right? Yes. I do. 
I have. You do. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you have to have a ginormous family to have that many people come out to be donors. Mm -hmm. But again, you're obviously well loved and well liked. And, and they were fighting over who was going to be the donor. Well, see, that's the nice well it came down to my son and I were fighting who or who was going to be the donor. Oh, your son should have known better. Mom always wins. That's because, a given. Because, you know, his own family, his siblings, and, well, they ruled out his parents. And he didn't match everybody in the family mm -hmm. anymore. And but, the second time, all three of your children yes, matched. Yes, three children matched, and they were fighting over who was going to be the donor. So the, set, the first time, was my son and I, my all, our oldest son and I, fighting over who was going to be the donor, and the second time it was our oldest son again and our daughter. Our our younger son said he would go. He would be tested if mm -hmm. necessary, but he would go last. Okay. Because it would impact his being able to work. And really couldn't not work. But he would, you know, he would He would gladly give up his kidney for his dad, right. but it would if, also if mean a career to, change right. or something. But he, you know, it would impact his family more severely mm -hmm. than the other ones. So Can I ask you, how did you feel about your children wanting to be donors? Especially the first time around. Well, the first time around, um, I didn't want my son to be the donor. I definitely didn't want mm -hmm. to be, him to be the donor. He, and the transplant doctor, Dr. Van Dem, and we let him decide because my son and I were just arguing back and forth who was going to be the donor. And we let Dr. Grossman decide who he thought would be the best. Person. So he was the tipping point. Well, because we both wanted to do it, mm -hmm. and my son had not quite been turned 18 yet. So, first of all, he was underage. So that made it easy for Dr. Grossman to make that decision. But it was only it was only a month, mm -hmm. like not even a month, like three weeks, that he would have been able to do it. Yeah, would have just delayed the surgery yeah, until he right. turned 18, but... Um, and he had just started college, so, you know, I, I just, I didn't want him to do it. And then, the second time, when Laura did it, our daughter did it, I was like, I was like a wreck. Mm -hmm. Because not only was he going into surgery, my baby was going into surgery. I can imagine. And well, I the, can't imagine. I have the to day the day we went down to the hospital, and, you know, down to Penn to do it, I just couldn't. I just couldn't stop crying. I was just so mm -hmm. worried about. Both of well, you know what she was in for too. I mean, you lived it. You I lived it, and for. she knew what she was in for mm -hmm. too, and she didn't seem to be afraid of that. And she had even said to Bob, well, she was working the weekend that he was diagnosed with going into end-stage renal disease the second time. Mm -hmm. And she told him that day in the emergency room, we I had taken him into Penn, and in the emergency room when she found out from one of the doctors that had seen him that he was in kidney failure, um, she told him that day that she was going to give him his kidney. So. Wow. So she knew from day one that that's what she wanted to do. And how old was she at the time? She's 32, going to be 32, so it was six years ago, 20, 26. So she had a little girl, three-year-old daughter. She has a three-year-old now? She had at the time. When she... Oh, at the time, yeah. Hey, Ron was three. Mm -hmm. She's nine now. She's nine now. Yeah, so... But let me she interrupt just for one second, because... This is a very unique audience, as I was thinking about it. So for the sake of our other audience, real quick, let's go around and introduce yourselves like we did before we started taping. Sue, real quick again. I'm Sue, Bob's wife, and I'm a living kidney donor for Bob. And I'm Bob. I've had two, uh, two kidney transplants. Sue gave me her kidney 22 years ago, at least 16 years. And when it failed, our daughter, Laura, gave me her kidney. And it'll be six years in May. Okay. Pam? And I'm the mother of a um, deceased organ donor. He was 13, and it'll be 17 years next month since he passed. And um, they recovered his liver and both of his kidneys after he was hit by a speeding motorist while he was riding his bicycle. Gwen? I'm Gwen, and I am a double lung transplant recipient. Um, one year. What I'm saying is so amazing. Here's this audience that just happened to come together, and our guest is talking about donation, and there's Pam sitting there. 
He's a double lung recipient, and you're sitting there as a double lung recipient. You're talking about living kidney donation, and here's a good example that's sitting here. It just is amazing that God has brought together this very mm -hmm. special audience for your sharing, and George. So I just it's wanted to bring amazing. that it's out. Like so the audience like, <laughs> like, <laughs> It's amazing what a really small world it is and how much we all really have in common. So, so coming back to you, I, I just had to put that in perspective for our audience. Mm -hmm. My question to you, I see you're working, you're up and you're about doing things. Myself, I'm an educator, so I work with children. Um, I was told by my doctor that I could no longer pursue my career based on being around germy little ones. Right. And, and they're, they're the germiest right. of them. <laughs> right, exactly. So my career is over as I know mm -hmm. it. Um, but I see that you're working, you're up and at it. How long did it take you to get that um, um, six months from the day of my transplant, I returned to being the nurse manager of the surgical intensive care unit. Um, my doc the doctors also told me the same thing. It's too dirty of an area. There's too much disease and pestilence, and you're too fragile. And I kind of looked at them and said, shut up, you're lying. <laughs> um, I was able to use the logic that, like, I don't know how to be anything other than a nurse. And not being able to practice my profession, then you wasted a long transplant because I am not going to sit home and wait to die. Mm. I mean, that's just not happening. I returned to work, um, and just before I hit the three month period, I did develop an infection in my lungs that came exclusively from the intensive care unit. Mm. Um, and it's an unusual strain, it's a mycobacterium that, you know, is. It's like a little sister of like a tuberculosis kind of thing. Um, it was diagnosed on testing when I did my bronch. And um, I didn't believe them. I still didn't believe them. And I didn't agree that I should leave my job. But that's when I decided that, you know, I pushed my luck for three years. I mean, how much longer can I push it? And I just started looking for another job that I thought I could live with. And the day I opened up the board to see what jobs were available, the kidney transplant coordinator job popped up while I was on the board. And I thought, well, there it is, it's meant to be. And um, my logic for, when I went for the interview, I said, you know what, you could look at my resume. I have a 22 page CV, you read whatever you want. I said, but the bottom line is I'm a recipient. I know what these people need, I know what they want, and I know where their heads are. I'll probably, you know, I will be the best coordinator you've ever had. And they bought it and gave me the job. <laughs> and I've been doing it, it's, it's, in fact, it's just nine months today since I started. And after about six months, they asked me to just take over control. And since then, I've already changed the whole department, how the whole thing operates, and I'm loving it. I gotta say, and I said this to many, people recently who I've met who had lung transplants in the last five, six, seven years. Back 20 years ago, when you saw somebody got a lung transplant, they didn't last long. And it's only in the last decade that it has improved to the point where people are doing just what you just described, George, and that is going back to work full time, mm -hmm. doing what they normally do. And I gotta tell you, I know at least a dozen locally. Don't tell Paul Albert that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Okay. There are always exceptions, but in general, it was a short-term solution to a problem. Today, I'm going to tell you, I've seen people Doris getting their transplant. What? Don't tell Doris King that. That's true. Another one. They've yeah. They've been double lungs for more than 20 years. Yes. That's true. Yeah. And they, they were the exception. The exception to the rule. Yes, yeah. I know Today, that, but... that's the norm. Surviving that long. Yeah. And so it's you're so... truly blessed, and you're both good examples of exactly what we're seeing today. Well, I just know these two people personally. Mm -hmm. Paul Albert's been probably 25 years yep. now with a yep. double lung. And Doris King had a double lung heart transplant, and she was, all of her organs were transposed, yeah, transposed mm -hmm. in her body. And she's been right around the 20 year marker. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. phenomenal. But those were exceptions. I met somebody that had a high number of years. Coincidentally, I was at a gift of life function at the Philadelphia Phillies game. And the person that I was working next to trying to get people to become donors 
was a lung, double lung transplant, and he was hitting it 19 years then. So it's probably call? about <laughs> 23 years now or so Ooh. since his transplant, doing phenomenally well. But the average until recently was about three years yeah. post-transplant. Yeah. Now they're hitting the nines and the tens, and the, I plan to go on for at least hey. 30. Oh. 30. <laughs> 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 Although I don't know if my wife could tolerate me for another 30 years. <laughs> But, um, well, George, do you see that the programs, and, and this could be for several reasons, are they being more aggressive in terms of accepting patients who just 10 years ago would not have been considered because they were too old? I'm running into people at the family house who are 70 mm -hmm. and out two weeks from a lung transplant and doing great. I mean, years ago, if you were both 55, they couldn't consider you. That was 60 and 65. Mm -hmm. How much of the business side of it drives something like this? Uh, you know, programs that need <laughs> need more. I'm not going to mention any programs, mm -hmm. right? But if they're a startup program, they need to get a number of transplants under their belt to certify, et cetera, et cetera. And do they? They seem to be, take uh, more high risk patients than a normal program would. Is that your experience? Have you seen that? That, that is the absolute norm. Um, when a new transplant center or new trans new organ transplant center decides to get wheels moving, the idea is to build the business. Um, just like Kmart needs to sell X number of diapers, you need to do X number of transplants in order to even be considered a true transplant center. Um, so yes, they do take higher risk patients, they do take older patients. A lot of Unosis criteria has changed recently. They inched further and further um, for age as far as who can be uh, a recipient, who can't be, who can be a donor, and who can't be. Now wait, let me stop you there. Because as, as I know the allocation rules, age is not, UNOS doesn't set an age limit for a recipient. They, they, leave, them, they leave it very gray. In what but sense? When you try to go over a certain age, they pull back. They pull back how? We've, I've, I've had situations where um, technically you're supposed to be able to transplant six months old to whenever right. uh, with no top age, but there's been some discouragement for people over 80. But UNOS is the and one that's 80, discouraging that? I'm sorry? UNOS is the one that's discouraging that or an individual program? Well, the program kind of drives the bus. Right. To be perfectly honest with you, but if somebody is on the list that's going to get, for example, if there's a 29-year-old heart or lung or right. kidney, right. they're not going to let you give it to a 90-year-old. Right. They're not going to let you. Okay, in that sense. Um, so that's where they're curtailing who gets what because gotcha. they can't flatly come out because then that would be showing a bias. Right. You know, except like in the case where we had in Philadelphia not long ago, where they were petitioning for a youngster to get adult lungs because they thought that she should have been transplanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing. And theoretically and philosophically, I had a problem with that because we don't know what adult any organ is going to do to a child. We don't know what the hormonal changes that take place in an adult would do to a child who hasn't even begun to experience those changes. Um, the other side of the coin is, with the lungs, you're, you're, they're gonna have to cut them in order for them to fit into a child. And that's all good and well, but you're wasting half of two lungs. Um, you are depriving someone else of getting a, a transplant that would benefit truly from it. And in that situation that we just referenced, it was more than one transplant mm -hmm. in a very short period of time. So that was two adults that probably would have survived that very productive lives. Not that you don't want the child to get it, but yeah. I, I don't know how appropriate that was. Mm -hmm. And the, the fact that even the governmental agencies intervened and said that it wasn't appropriate and it wasn't safe you know, they pushed the, the, the bar to the point where the institution didn't really have a choice. Hmm. Back to where you were talking, I'm sorry. 
had to bring that out given. No, seriously, I'm talking. Not where I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were talking about the success of lung transplants mm -hmm. so improved these days over the years ago and the extended age that I'm seeing people mm -hmm. receive and the business side of transplantation. So for example, and taking that into the kidney area for you, uh, when you're talking about a candidate and you're not on the group that makes the decision, make that clear, uh, who's not compliant before the transplant even, uh, how much business part of the transplant process causes decisions to be made to give, to list somebody for a kidney, for example, mm -hmm. when, as you said, there's very obvious signals, be it a heavy smoker, for example, or in the case you cited, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but hey, we're doing more kidneys and we can get a kidney for them as opposed to, wait a minute, this is not a good candidate for this because they're not compliant now, how are they going to be compliant later? And I, I think the, the reality of it is with any um, organ transplant center in the, in the initial phases, you have to show that you're growing the business. You have to show that you're doing X number of transplants. And if you're going to be using those high risk patients, you're more than likely going to be giving them high risk organs as well. Um, but you're going to transplant them. Everybody is entitled to a transplant. Whether they abuse it or not is their problem or their prerogative. Of course. After a, a center becomes established, then you, you'll start seeing where they become progressively more discerning about who they put onto the list and who they don't. Now you just transitioned into another very hot topic. Uh -huh and that is the results that are measured by UNOS mm -hmm. and also as part of the marketing. I mean, if you're looking for a hospital to get a transplant, you look to see what their success rates are. So if they're taking high-risk patients and taking in high-risk organs, you would expect that the results are probably not as good as somebody that's more conservative on both of those. Precisely. And so uh, their results could cause them to be censured by UNOS, for example. They could be censured by units and they could also end up out of business by the CMS, which is the, the governmental agency that sort of moderates um, Medicare and Medicaid and all that kind of stuff. And let's be serious, they drive the bus. Mm -hmm. They're not paying you for it, you're not doing it. Right. Um, so the, you're talking about the SRTR data, which is the statistical data where they measure an institution's success against the nation's success. And you could get away with it for a year. You might even be able to get away with the low numbers two years. You're not going to get away with it three years. CMS is going to come in and shut you down. What I found fascinating, and just to add to what you've just said, George, uh, 10 years ago I found myself on the UNOS Thoracic Transplantation Committee. And part of that process was groups of three of us were assigned cases to review mm -hmm. the performance and make recommendations to the committee and to the MPSC as to what to do about programs that were not performing to the standards that were expected given the population that they even serve. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, just what you just said, it was fascinating to see no program, unless they're really egregious, uh, got shut down quickly. Everything was done to improve the program right. and give them the support they needed, but it was carefully watched. And uh, yeah, the program takes a risk when they take risk, as we just described, both in terms of organs they accept mm -hmm. and risky patients in the first place. Precisely, and I mean, they're very specific when CMS comes out or any of the organizations, the government or HRSA, they give you a, an action plan. And these are the five things that you need to change in order to remain a transplant center. And then they expect from you within a certain time frame, and it's not, a year, it's a couple of months, exactly how you're going to make those changes and what the changes you're going to implement to improve your statistics. If you don't do it, then in a year's time, they're going to shut you down, you know, by the end of the next year. Unfortunately, all of that data is always two years behind. So that they may start seeing a problem in 2014 but really, the, this, the, you, this 
um, center is not going to really pay the price until 2017, which puts quite a few folks at jeopardy. You know, and a lot of people go to where they're comfortable. You know, and mm -hmm. you know, you can go to some small, tiny hospital somewhere in, in the country, and you say, "All right, well, this is the hospital I know, and birthed my babies here, and had my broken bone fixed here, and." Watch my grandpa die here. This is where I'm getting my transplant. And every yeah. transplant recipient thinks that the program that caused them to survive is mm -hmm. the greatest program in the whole country, which they are for them. Oh, yeah, but my program really was the best program in the country. <laughs> 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 well, I'll tell you, I, I know your surgeon. Mm -hmm. And I've been with him when he was doing procurements on the other side, on the donor side, and he is a phenomenal surgeon. So you should feel confident. And um, the chairman of that department used to be the chairman of our department at Penn. Well, so you got top notch. God was I good to tell you. you that personally. <laughs> you great. George. I have a question. Yes. How is the business side different between deceased donor kidney transplantation and living donor transplantation? It, it's really not a whole lot different. Um, it, there, there is when it comes down to physician preference, the surgeon's preference. A lot of surgeons and a lot of institutions will do significantly more living donors mm -hmm. because by default your statistics are going to be better. Okay. Um, your, your measure of how good you really are is how many cadaveric organs you transplant mm -hmm. because they're, they're not necessarily in optimal condition at all times. Correct. You know, how long the person's been sick, however, yeah. you know, whatever their mechanism of injury was is going to have some impact. How long it took to recover and... Okay. Precisely. And that's, you know, and the compliance piece pays a big role into it with the recipient. What are you seeing in terms of altruistic kidney living donors? You see many in this area? I've, I've seen a couple. Um, I did see one in this area, in fact, at my institution, and that is a very unique, special individual that can just decide there's too many people that need kidneys, and I'm giving one of mine because I only need one. Now, the process, as these guys can tell you, is so intense that there's not even the slightest possibility that the donor's kidney, other kidney, will fail that we allow them to be a donor. You, you've really got to be in optimal health with no indication that you're going to develop one of the diseases that will cause your kidney to fail. So the, 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 the screening process is very intense. In some ways, I think, more intense for the donor than for the recipient. I have to tell you, though, when I, had, I was being tested as a donor, I had hypertension at the time, you did. but it was under control. Mm -hmm. But I took medication for it. More than two medications, or I don't remember, don't but remember. I did have hypertension. At the time. And how about since then? I have hypertension, yeah. Wow. But they took my kidney, mm -hmm. so it must have been okay. Yeah, it must have been I at mean, a level where they, it was not. You know, they tested. They, I did all this stuff that had to be done mm -hmm. as an inpatient. Well, yeah, because at that time, 22 years ago. Yeah. yeah, you went in and spent three days just collecting your pee mm -hmm. and getting your blood drawn. And then the last day was the actual arteriogram, I mean, pee. And right, all, that, all the heavy duty stuff. Now everything is outpatient. Stuff. But of course, you're talking about the times where it was okay to drop grandma off at the hospital the day before the holidays and then pick them up two days after the holidays. Mm -hmm. You know, that was common behavior back in the day. Yeah, we brought Bob in. Uh, we had the surgery on Thursday. And I think we got in Monday. Monday, yeah. He came in Monday. He had worked that day, and our friend dropped, brought him into the hospital after he got him from work. Wow. And he was admitted Monday. And then they started him on the anti-rejection medication. <laughs> and, and that's he cross matched us again to make sure we were with still compatible. Yeah. They, they cross match a million times, up, right up until the last, up until the, the knife goes in. They have to just keep making sure that, because everything that happens to you and everything that you do creates 
antibodies in your body that changes the match. Interesting. Yeah, I believe we didn't know surgery was going to go on until like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. night. I finally got clearance. The, the, the final clearance. And yeah. then they start the surgery the next morning. Well, the morning, first, first thing in the morning. Yeah. Wow. Now, Laura, now he's have had, had, has had some problems with the antibody, antigen, antibodies, mm -hmm. whatever, because of getting our daughter's kidney. And I guess she's got some of my antibodies in her. She's going to have some of yours and some of his. his and, so he has to take medication for that. And she had a baby, and that changes well, the antibodies the as well. Beforehand. She already had the baby. Before, right. You know. But that changes your antibodies as well. Well. And there was some, since the transplant, he has had some problems, mm -hmm. and so they had to he has to take medication for that, hopefully. And then Dr. told us that it's not that it it's going to fail, but it may not last as long as right. it would have without the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's that's unfortunately the luck of the draw. It's, right. it's going to be what it is, but. Every day that you're but you don't have any guarantees anyway that it's going to Nothing's a guarantee. And nothing's a guarantee, and who knows what tomorrow brings. So exactly. we live for today. And you know, that's exactly right. You have to recognize that each day that you get is a gift, and you're living on borrowed time, and appreciate it for what it is. And when you say about, you're questionable about sometimes about the recipient's compliance, there ain't no problem with him to comply because I'm in the picture. Uh, clearly, if he's kept the kidney for 16 years. <laughs> there ain't no problem at all with him being compliant. Well, and it, you would think it would be easier to be compliant post-transplant because the rules aren't as strict. You can, you can eat a regular diet. You don't have to have a fluid restriction. You can travel without being attached to a machine. There's a million good reasons why your life is better after a transplant. So, Take a couple pills a day and get over yourself. Yeah. George, take us back to when you became a patient as opposed to the nurse you were. Mm -hmm. How, what, what kind of experiences did you have with the knowledge you had from the nursing side all of a sudden to find yourself as the patient? What was that like? <clears throat> Bizarre to say the least. He wasn't a good patient. Okay. <laughs> um, no, actually, actually, I was a very good patient, but I made it very clear from day one that if this bus is moving, I'm driving it. Um, and that's where a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. Um, because I really didn't understand transplant as well as I should have. And I went for a completely different reason and after they did the evaluation process, they were like, all right, well, you need a double lung transplant and probably a heart. I was like, yeah, be it. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and it took me a long time. Fortunately, they listed me early, um, knowing that it was going to take me a long time to really come to terms with the fact. Uh, and it did. You know, I was doing everything. I, very regimental. I did everything exactly what they told me, exactly when they told me, and exactly how they told me. All along thinking like, they're wrong. They're going to figure out that they read something wrong, they did something wrong. Let me see all those scans and studies and everything you did. I need to evaluate them myself. But I was wrong. A very different form of denial than mm -hmm. most patients who go through denial, denial, right? And it took me a long time to get out of denial. Um, then I think when you go into the acceptance phase, and you guys can tell me more from another perspective, once I went into the acceptance phase, it was more an acceptance of impending death and not getting a transplant than it was, I'm going to get a transplant that's going to change my life. Um, it changed my life in the way I think. It didn't change my life the way I live it. And Somehow or another, I thought there was going to be some miracle that was going to, you know, I was going to look like Rock Hudson and I was going to be, you know, <laughs> nothing changed. So yeah. what, how did it change your thinking? It changed because now I'm fully functional again. I could do everything that I did when I was a younger person, um, before I became ill, without thinking twice whether or not I can do it. And... I have to tell you, the six years before my transplant, that wasn't so much the case. Well, you know, even I worked up until the day I got my transplant, but it, it was it was a tough road, 
and fortunately I was in the role that I was in, I could go in when I felt up to going in. And if I had to leave, I could leave when I felt like I couldn't take it anymore. Um, not everybody has that luxury. So from the perspective of having visited both sides of this amazing experience, what advice would you give a patient today who's facing a serious organ transplant? I think the best advice I can give is if they believe in, in a God, that they need to communicate with that, that God and find out what really is the best thing for them because I think you need to go into it knowing that you're doing the right thing for you. I think you need to realize that while your physician team are not necessarily gods, they're the closest thing we have on earth and if they're telling you to only color in blue pen and blue crayon, and you better lose all your other crayons and follow the rules exactly the way they're, they're predicting them to be because that's the only way you're going to not only survive but thrive. And, and I think that's something that sometimes is lost on a lot of people. Now the other thing that you talked about was how this affected how you deal with patients today. You talked about not being as judgmental as you first thought. Uh, you used the words, for example, um, a, a, a transplant bigot. Mm -hmm. What other ways has it changed how you deal with your patients today? How has it affected the service you give your patients in a kidney transplant environment? Actually, I think initially, and I have to be honest with you, and you know, I might, that might be one of the things I'm going to get to today. <laughs> I found myself being less tolerant than I was for the 35 years prior to that, to my transplant. Of patients um, or staff? I'm sorry? Of patients or staff, less tolerant? Of patients. Okay. You know, if, you know, before it used to be, oh, it's a sin, you know, we got to do what's right for the patient, it doesn't matter, we can get them where they need to be, we can get them services, we can do this, we can do that. After having had a transplant myself, it's like, look, pal, it's all on you. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you either got to dance to dance or you got to let you walk away. And I, I still feel strongly about that. I feel like, you know, you're being given an opportunity for a second chance at life. Don't, don't blow it like you did the first opportunity. It's, it's, it's just wrong. It's, it's wrong on so many levels. <laughs> Do you agree? I absolutely agree. I do yeah. If you're not going to be compliant, why did you even get why listed in the first it? place? Why I, did you I, go I through this? I think a lot of people feel entitled. Why did you take that organ away from somebody who could have used and it well that would have appreciated and appreciated exactly. being compliant and lived a full life with it mm -hmm. instead of sitting in the chair? Right. Um, I mean, and and it's amazing how many people, and we're not going to talk about anybody we know or don't know, <laughs> but. Some people look, look for that day when, okay, I'm, I got a transplant, now I'll never work again. Mm -hmm. Let me be like, on permanent disability for the rest of my life. And, and that is the mentality of a lot of people, mm -hmm. and it, 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 it boggles my mind because I, I was sitting there still having sutures in my chest, and I'm like, okay, when can I go back to work? <laughs> you know? And there are some who go back to work and it doesn't work well for them, or they get sick. Right. Again, it, then they have to go on disability, and that's a different story. That's a completely It's those different that have the expectation that now I'm never going to have to work again. Mm -hmm. You be, you know, um, yeah. let me just sit in the you chair come complacent and, and it's like, you know, go shopping all day or whatever. Let the world live, do my living for me, yeah. and I'll see what happens. And, you know, I, I just can't fathom that. I mean, unfortunately for the rest of the world, not everybody is a nurse. So that you don't have the other opportunities and the other venues of nursing that you can go into that I have. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I could have went into a job where I sat in a room and looked at charts for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have felt like being a nurse, but I would have still had that option. Correct. Um, so, but not every, not every career, you know, if you're a welder, I, mean, I don't think there's too many ways that you could not be around all that smoke and fume and fire and all that stuff. You know, and then you don't have a choice or get yourself trained Correct. to do something different. And, and I can appreciate that as well. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like they're, they're, your brain's working fine. It was your kidneys or your liver or whatever that didn't work. Go get educated. 
you know, SSI will gladly put somebody through a training program, probably at no cost to themselves, to do something productive in this world. And, you know, you get an opportunity like a transplant, you, you better be doing something productive. Even if it is that what your productivity is, is getting involved with an organization like Gift of Life or one of the other organ donation procurement com uh, agencies, because then you're giving something back. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, again, sitting, sitting and packing envelopes or something is, you're still doing something valuable for somebody. And I, I think that's the least you can do when you receive a transplant. Years ago, we had some security people in here talking to a support group, and it was the biggest group we've ever pulled out. I mean, the room was standing room only. Mm -hmm. And I can still recall, and this goes back at least 15 years, if not more, so that's how much it stood out at the time, when one of the mothers addressed the speaker, adamant that how could they possibly expect her 18-year-old son, who's had a kidney transplant, a couple of years ago, to ever go to work? What's wrong with that? And I can still hear that mentality. Mm -hmm. And so let me turn that into a question for you. What advice would you give to the caregivers of patients in terms of how they, through their expectations maybe, mm -hmm. affect the outcome or how that patient lives their life? What kind of recommendation would you give the caregivers well, in dealing in, with the in patient? In that particular situation that you referenced, I, I think I would have to say, Mom, it's time to let the baby grow up cut the apron strings, he needs to grow up, he needs to be productive, and I would have the same conversation with him. Because it's very easy to get into that um, reliant role and like the world, I can't do anything for myself. You are healthy. You've received a transplant. Don't get me wrong, there are sequelae that go with every transplant, there are side effects, there are issues, there's no taking that, that away. But you are now a healthy person. And you need to be productive. You need to do something productive on this earth because I find it very hard to believe and, and, and that whoever your God is gave you an opportunity at, at a second chance of life so that you can do nothing. There has to be a higher calling. There has to be something else in store. And you need to pursue it because unfortunately, unlike Moses, He's not going to come to you and say, here it is. So how does a caregiver make some judgments as to how far to, support's the wrong word, uh, to enable the patient such that they don't recover completely as they should if they were left on their own maybe? So, I mean, there's a, a level of support and then it's too much support. Being supportive and being... Um, somebody who is actually propagating the problem are two very different things. And I think most parents will do anything they can to support their child grow and to move through life naturally. Doing what that mom wanted to do with her son is no different than going out and buying a drug and drugs. You know, oh, you're a heroin addict, I'll go buy you your heroin so that you can shoot up all you want or whatever the drug of choice may be. I mean, enabling is enabling, no matter what the scenario is. And whether you're enabling an alcoholic or a drug addict or an abusive person or a transplant recipient, you're still enabling. You're keeping him in a sick role unnecessarily. And at 18, there's no reason why he should be in a sick role. I mean, you know, look at him. Mm -hmm. Cancer, I'm, I'm referring to the photograph up there. Oh. He had cancer, he ended up needing a heart transplant, and he's a triathlon person. Really? And you're sitting home watching soap operas when you're 18? Not acceptable. Let me shift the conversation in another direction that you haven't touched on. Uh, TRIO is looking into finding what can a national organization like TRIO do to help support and address the high risk of cancer in our membership and our patients. From your perspective, both as a medical professional and now as a double lung recipient who is taking drugs which make you a high risk for cancer, so all different types, 
what's your thoughts on that? What's your experience? What advice do you have, having seen both sides of it, and now that you're in that side where you're at risk? I think that, I think, first of all, I think that we all kind of know to some degree that you are at risk for cancers because you're, you're turning off your immune system. So in order for your body not to know that those lungs or that kidney or that bone or whatever that is in you is not really yours, it's also not going to recognize tumors or anything else. The reality of it is with the anti-rejection medications, the most common and most prevalent form of cancer is skin cancer. And there are a million different things that you're advised to do to prevent it. So if you're going to go lather yourself up in baby oil and lay on the beach for eight hours, you're asking for it. But at the same time, if you use sunscreen and you do all those things and you prevent those melanomas, hopefully you'll be one of the fortunate ones that you won't get another form of cancer. And who's to say that that form of cancer that you end up with, you weren't predestined to have it anyway. You know, I'm referring to, you know, once men reach a certain age, the probability of prostate cancer is very high. When women reach a certain age, the probability of breast cancer, the longer you live, the, more, the higher the mm -hmm. probability that you're going to develop one of those forms of cancer. And then you, you, got, you kind of have to wonder, well, which came first, the cart or the horse? Were you predestined for that, or was it strictly because of your anti-rejection? Uh, and I think it's probably going to be more of a combination. But that's just my opinion. That's mm -hmm. not based anywhere in medical fact. Not your observations, both as a medical professional mm -hmm. and as a patient. Thank you. And what kind of advice or cautions do you maybe give candidates who are facing transplant in terms of, without being dramatic and negative, still preparing them for whatever can happen post-transplant? What kind of advice do you give people? Or do you stay away from it? That, no, I don't stay away from anything. Um, <laughs> I didn't think you did. <laughs> that's probably my downfall. <laughs> I, I think that the most significant piece of it is that you have to present the positives. You, you need to help a person understand that, like, as I said with the kidney person, you're not going to be attached to a machine. You can travel anywhere in the world you want. You can eat whatever you feel like. It. You can drink an unlimited diet doesn't mean to go out and get loaded every Tuesday night just because you can. You know, you have to take certain logical precautions. Um, I, I think when I go through my uh, consents and my training with my, my, potential, my potential recipient, I, I think I must say to them at least a hundred times in the course of a two-hour conversation, you are going to be on stringent medications for the rest of your life. Can you handle that? Can you set an alarm on your watch so that you're always taking your meds when you're supposed to take them? If you can't live like that, then you really don't want a transplant. Um, nobody ever says they can't live like that. You know, you, you can't go back into the lifestyles that brought you where you are. You know, you, you can't eat the bad foods to you know give you hypertension and, and drink the certain things that. You know, you have to avoid those things even though you've had a transplant. And I think 50% of the time people hear it, and 50% of the time they don't. I, I think a lot of people go into a transplant thinking it's the miracle, which it is, but they think it's going to change everything. You know, like I said, I thought I was going to come out like looking completely different and being all kinds of buff and all this, and hmm, didn't happen. Um, and of course, I'm being facetious, but. I wonder how many people really do go into it thinking, I want to get this transplant that's going to fix my whole life. You know, not unlike, you know, a lot of people, oh, I'm in a bad marriage, but when I have a baby, it's going to fix everything. No, it just adds one more person to the problem. A transplant is not a cure, it's a treatment. For exactly, thank you. That's exactly right. Because you just go to treatment. another realm of, of, you know, medicine. You go, but you go to another area of wellness, right. and going to wellness from sickness is a phenomenal leap, and I think that's what's lost on some people. Even going into it, I think they just don't, they just see the end prize, and don't realize that that road is tough, and sometimes it's tougher than other times.
just that six weeks of uh, rehab after a long time. <laughs> It's like if I come to walk one more step on this stupid uh, treadmill, you know, and then they say, oh, well, let's have the bike, uh, all right, let's start yeah, having some weights. It's like you really are smoking the wrong stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it works. It, you know, it's everything that it's cracked up to be. However, it's not fun when you're doing it, especially the day after you're transplanted. You're in you rehab, good. like, acting like, you know, okay, I'm going to sit here and exercise. Do the arm bike, mm -hmm. <laughs> walk the steps, and then they can get a rubber bands to play with when you're at home so that you exercise. And it's like, yeah, you some know, of that's because you're already pretty out of shape because of your lung capacity oh, you're completely right. so minimal that the rest you know, of your body is completely deconditioned. Right. It's, you need to do that just yeah. to be able to survive, but it's all worth it in the end. What other questions does anybody have? I didn't mean to dominate with those questions, but please. Well, Jim, you did. No, <laughs> I'm apologizing, yes. okay? No, we know him well enough. <laughs> the only thing I have to say is that my own mind, I still have a very young mind, but my body has deteriorated. I know that feeling well. <laughs> and I often say to myself, why can't I do these things when my mind says I can, but my body says I can't? Now, I haven't tried lately, but I'm trying to learn how to run again. And my coordination's not there. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I get the lung right now to do it. But I still, in my mind, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sue does remind me that I'm, I am 65 now, that uh, it's not going to happen. <laughs> well, and, and, and she's right. Yeah. And I think the funny thing about when people are waiting for a transplant and when they're so sick, mm -hmm. you're so focused on the area of your body that is so sick, your kidneys or your lungs or your heart. That's all you can think of. It's like, I know with me it was like, just let me take that next breath. Mm -hmm. Who ever thought, like, I went from 50 to 60 and... This th thing started to not work well, and that thing started to hurt, and the other thing, I didn't even notice. All of a sudden, I got a transplant, and it's like, oh, why does that hurt? Mm -hmm. And of course, it's all because of a transplant. Yeah, no, I got old in the process. And you know, after my first transplant, I went back to work, which I was doing construction. Mm -hmm. And I did some heavy work. work. construction work? Yes. Wow. And uh, I never gave a thought to just step back. Mm -hmm. You know, I, mm -hmm. again, I was... Well, and that's why he kept her kidney for 16 years. And then, uh, then when I retired in 2000, I thought that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. But then I got bored and went back to work as a school bus driver. Yes, yeah, so that's I just, what I worry about. And I just, well, I just gave up. Was in between that time, I was real sick, mm -hmm. and uh, I had an infection of unknown origin. Those kids made you sick. And <laughs> I wanted to go back, which I did after I got well, and I came out of nursing mm -hmm. home. I went back to driving the school bus again, wow. and then I finally gave it up with a lot of encouragement from, from her because I had no idea what caused that problem I had. Mm. Yeah, and sometimes that really is, yeah. the coordination is different, um, you know, everything is different, I have to admit that, but I, I But wait a minute, I haven't had a transplant and I have those same problems. <laughs> right, it, it, it's going to happen. You know, because we age, but I think yeah. in that time that you're sick, like you lose all those years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you think, oh, well, I'm still 48. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now you're 60. Well, yeah. I go out with the grandkids now, play ball, and run with them. Mm -hmm. Not run with them, but walk fast. Right. And uh, then it takes me two or three days to recover. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that feeling really well. That's, uh, and, and I think that's just the nature. Of, that's one of the side effects or one of the sequelae of number one becoming aging, yeah. and number two, having had major, major surgery, a transplant, your body's not used yeah. to it. The medications do have an impact, whether we want to admit it or not. And I still think life is a bowl of cherries compared to what it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, even a bowl of cherries has some pits in it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that's the, the big piece that we need to recognize. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard piece to recognize. But I also have a great caregiver. Yeah, you're very fortunate. You are very fortunate. Um, hope you appreciate it. No, I'm sure he does. Which also he gives does. you a purpose for living, which drives it too. Yeah. Well, Sue and I have been together since ninth grade. 
65 we met. Oh, so, that's a long time. Yeah. That's phenomenal. And we've been married coming off 43 years now. That is phenomenal. Yeah. Got a lot invested in each other. There's a lot yeah. more years left. 43 years? I don't have 50 without problems. Right? Oh, yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. I hope so. And they're going to go on a cruise this summer. <laughs> there you go. A cruise. We're really going to eat and drink and not worry about dialysis. No, we're going to go on three or four cruises a year. Oh, so okay. Years. So that's not a bargain. <laughs> well, I was fortunate. The first transplant, I was never on dialysis. I was ready for kidney failure right to the transplant. Oh, that, so you were not yet on dialysis mm -hmm. when you yeah. had the transplant? Boy, that's the, the second time better. I need to go on the dialysis for you know, how many a couple months? months. Mm -hmm. A few months, anyway. So mm -hmm. Laura was yeah. tested, or mm -hmm. the kids were tested, and Laura was, you know, screened as Deemed a donor. to be the person. Yeah. You're very fortunate, so. because, you know, sometimes the dialysis is worse than the transplant. Mm -hmm. But he was only on for a couple of months. You know. So I think we But he, you know, he had problems with the diet and the, you know, uh, the overload of fluids, and mm -hmm. he didn't do well with dialysis at all. Well, it, it, dialysis is, is it's, it's a lifesaver, there's no two ways about it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's got its drawbacks. And it, there's a lot of bad things that happen to people on dialysis, and, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately we don't have enough kidneys to go around. Mm -hmm. you know? um, we need more donors, that's really the bottom line. But then again, he's he's seen people who are on dialysis and they don't they're not listed to get a kidney transplant because they don't they don't realize that they can get that mm -hmm. to make themselves you know well again well and and, and they're so complacent with being on dialysis mm -hmm. that they don't want to change their life they're used to this routine in life well you know for some people it really is it's they no longer have to work because they're on dialysis. They now have a social venue three times a week where they see the same people, spend three or four hours a day with them so they feel like their social life is just full. I mean, I get it. I mean, we've had people come to us. They've been on dialysis for five years and they're just coming in for being evaluated for a transplant now. It's like, you could have been transplanted. Not so much anymore now. It's up to five and a half years in Philly. Go to New York, and you're talking almost eight years. Well, my cousin has one of my son's kidneys. He was on dialysis for two and a half years at the time, mm -hmm. and was on a list waiting. But um, he probably would not have gotten a kidney just because it was PKD, mm -hmm. and um, so you know they. It was a designated donation, right. and he could bump people, but they said it had to be a full antigen match mm -hmm. in order to do that, and it was. But he said that he couldn't wait to get off of dialysis. He right. hated the dialysis yeah, I think you have three times both a week. Sides and, of the coin. Um, but he was very compliant mm -hmm. with it, with the hopes that something would happen, mm -hmm. that he would eventually get transplanted. Right. But he never looked at anybody for a living donation. Some people are now comfortable with Now, that. this is 17 years ago mm -hmm. as well, so... Yeah. Now, the times were different, yeah. so that it wasn't as common. Um, at the same time, the, the, the rules for being a donor are so stringent that, you know, like said, yeah. out of 11, only five were eligible. Mm -hmm. And then for testing would have gone further, how many more would that have <coughs> Well, most of the family members have PKD, so that mm -hmm. eliminates them. So that eliminates them completely. Yeah. Well, this sort of applies to just about every aspect of um, mm -hmm. transplantation. Well, of course, I've heard people at Temple when I go to my doctor's visits, they sit there and they talk about their experiences, how they get on the table, then they find out that they, you know, when they bring the, the, the lungs in, mm -hmm. that they couldn't, they weren't prepared for them. Right. You know, they weren't compatible. They weren't compatible. So they sewed them up and sent them out. Well, mm -hmm. I'm not cut them to tell them that we can't use. Mm -hmm. Has that ever happened to you? No, I, first time in. I, I got pulled in once, and uh, <coughs> they didn't cut anything or do anything. You know, right. I was still sitting there talking to everybody and chatting everybody up. And when they did the procurement, they realized that the lungs weren't as good as they appeared to be. Right. Okay. So they, you know, well, we're going to take you to the hospital and send you home tomorrow morning. Yeah, now I'm going home now.
I mean, it was one o'clock in the morning. I didn't hear. Right. 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 That's what I was calling you late for. But the next time they came in, it was like you know, boom, boom, boom. The next thing I know, so what I woke would up you lungs. tell someone? Um, for example, it's this lady, and she has she needs lungs, mm -hmm. and she's on that oxygen, and I think she's bumped up to like twelve liters. Okay, so she's really. But she won't. She's afraid to go with the she's transplant. She'll mm -hmm. rather just mellow out. So she's just waiting to die. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. How would you get them to understand or try to get them to I, I think the best you could do is to tell her your experience, get her whatever written material is available for her to read. And there's some good stuff on the internet that's very, um, like regular people, English, not medical jargon. Mm. Um, and the decision is, has to be hers through and through, but she needs to understand what she's getting into because maybe going through the transplant and the life that you have to leave after the transplant isn't a bargain for her either. You know, and that, that's, for me, that's really sad to hear that somebody thinks that way. Yeah. Well. And I think, how old is she? 39. Oh, she's a child. Yeah. Oh, wow. wow, she's far too young to, to be thinking that way. A lot of people feel, and even talking to certain people, feel um, if they go on, they, worse things can happen to them mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know. Well, I mean, eventually, maybe somewhere down the road, some worse things may happen to you as a result of getting you, a transplant and getting the, um, mm -hmm. anti rejection medications and all that kind of stuff. But the time between the transplant when that other bad exactly. thing happens is a hell of a good time. Hey. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Does anybody else have any other questions for George? George, if not, I'm going to turn to you and say, is there any last things that you'd like to say to our audience that we haven't covered or that you can think of? No, the only thing is my pet thing is get out there and preach donation, 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 and get as many people to sign on the dotted line as possible. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's the most significant thing that any of us can do. Well, in closing, what I'd like to do is offer you a, a little token of our gratitude. Pam, would you present that to Georgia? One choice, you're always one choice away from changing your life, and I certainly have heard that in your message. And so we offer that as something to uh, take on and reflect on and share with your own patients. And George, I thank you very much for a very entertaining evening with a lot of good well, if information. I'm, else I'm entertaining. I'll tell you. <laughs>